Thank you for joining us for the RAS Studio 1042 launch webinar. This webinar is presented by Marco Cantu, David Millington, Jim McKeith, and me, Serena DuPont. Now, before I go into detail on the 1042 release, I just wanted to take a quick moment to provide an overview on RAD Studio. Now, what is RAD Studio? RAD Studio is the ultimate IDE for building multi platform, high performance native applications using either Delphi or modern C with powerful visual design tools and integrated tool chains. RAD Studio includes many developer productivity tools enabling developers using Delphi and C++ Builder to get their applications to market five times faster. Developers can build fast native applications targeting multiple platforms with our FireMonkey framework or use our VCL framework for best-in-class Windows application development. And Marco is going to show you in just a couple of minutes all the great new features we added to the VCL in 10.4.2. Now, RAD Studio provides incredibly fast, native, universal database connectivity and development for leading data platforms, so it's really easy to build data-enabled applications. There are also hundreds of C++ libraries that can be used in C++ Builder or Delphi and RAD Studio, and RAD Studio also gives you access to all the platform APIs on all supported platforms. Now, when it comes to designing your application, we provide really powerful visual design tools that make prototyping really easy by allowing you to see how your data fits within your user interface design early on. This includes, for example, live data support, design time from multiple sources, including your databases and REST APIs. And then we also, if you're building a multi-device application, have a feature called live preview for multi-device applications that are built with the FireMonkey framework that allows you to easily see what your application is going to look like on a variety of devices as you're designing the application in the IDE. Now, Delphi and C++ Builder make it easy to go from prototype to production. You can easily build for and then publish your application within your own enterprise or target the various app stores. Rad Studio also has a great community of passionate MVPs, technology partners, trainers, authors, and developers. And when it comes to backward compatibility, we really aim to provide a high level of backward compatibility and support to make migrating to 10.4 simpler than before. In terms of target platform support, we provide best-in-class Windows 10 platform support with VCL, with a 64-bit Windows focus for high performance and high memory, and an even faster Windows 32-bit compiler. If you're using Delphi and the FireMonkey framework, you can target the latest operating systems for Windows, macOS, iOS, Android, and Linux, and with C++ Builder for Windows and iOS. Now, before I get to what's new in 10.4.2, I just wanted to briefly recap what we introduced in 10.4 and then further enhanced and updated in 10.4.1. In RAD Studio 10.4, we introduced major Delphi Code Insight improvements with our LSP support, a new Delphi language feature with custom managed records, unified memory management. For C++ Builder, expanded C++ library support and a new Windows 64-bit debugger, toolchain performance and quality enhancements. For VCL specifically, we introduced VCL style changes for high DPI support, new high DPI styles, also VCL per control styling, and a number of new VCL components. We also performed numerous Windows API updates. We expanded our FireMonkey support and made numerous runtime library enhancements and IDE enhancements in the 10.4 release. Now let's see what's new in RAD Studio 10.4.2. RAD Studio 10.4.2 includes best-in-class Windows application support, including some new VCL controls that Marco and Jim are going to show in just a couple of minutes new developer productivity and user experience features that David's going to talk about, expanded FireMonkey platform support that Marco's going to highlight and demo, new Delphi and C++ features, and an additional enhancements and quality improvements. And with that, I'm going to pass the mic to Marco. Marco? Thanks, Sarina. I am Marco Cantu, and the first area of Time for Two I want to delve into with you is the Windows application support. We offer the best in class Windows desktop solution with um, the visual component library of VCL. And what we keep doing release after release is enhance and uh, add features to this core library that allows you to rapidly build the user interface of your desktop application. Beside the specific features that we're working on and I'm going to highlight and cover soon, it's important to notice that the Windows desktop in terms of the API that Microsoft is providing is ongoing a significant transformation, which is highlighted by 
project reunion from Microsoft, which is a way to reinvent the platform API, giving a relevant role, if not a predominant role, to the good old classic Win32 APIs and native application, which is exactly what Rust Studio has been focused on. Now, there are two features that are part of this project union support that we are improving or introducing in time for two. One is MSIX support that I'll cover in a second. And the other is the T-Edge browser that we are enhancing and was already part of time for. But before we go to that, let's focus one second on two new controls that we added on the visual component library with the goal of helping you build modern looking and high performance applications. T control list is a virtualized list with a really very high performance. It can only handle graphical elements, but it can handle million of items because again, they're virtual, they're not actually created. If you have ever used the good old TB, TDB control list, this is where the idea came from. What you do is design one of the elements and then these elements are duplicated for dozens, hundreds, millions of times virtually in terms of layout. The grid supports single column or multiple columns, support different flows, and it can really adapt to the available space. You can use graphic, any T graphic control. You can use text, labels, of course. There is a special button that goes along with, with grids. And it also has some wizards that allow you to easily create nice looking items for, for your list. Uh, again, the main goal here is because everything is virtual and even the images are cached, it can really handle a very large number of items and it can be very fast when scrolling through this uh, huge amount of elements. It also allows you to use visualize binding and just connect to your database data. The second component we introduced is a number box or numeric input. This is a modern looking control again with uh, specific buttons to go up and down one element. You can also allow paging. It allows you to enter integers, floating point numbers of currency values and includes an expression evaluation. So it can actually enter an expression, I mean, 10 times two, and your input will be 20 in the number box. Now, as I was mentioning, we are supporting MSAX, which is the package format that Microsoft is pushing Windows towards. We supported AppX over the last few releases, and now we've switched from AppX to MSAX. This is the format you can use when deploying Windows Store applications. It's also the preferred way for enterprise deployment because an MSAX package being virtualized meaning it has limited access to the file system and registry, it can be installed by the end user rather than requiring an admin account on the machine. And again, MSAX is one of the cornerstones of Project Reunion, which we are looking forward to support in full over the coming few releases of Rust Studio. Now, there are other significant improvements in the VCL. The two that stand out and I want to highlight are the uh, upgraded Konopka components. There is a new package available in Getit for 10 for two users with styling and high DPI improvements. Now we are working on a further update that will really improve on the high DPI side. And that's going to be available again in Getit over the uh, coming weeks. We have also enhanced the TH browser component that we introduced in 10.4. This is a wrapper of the WebView 2 component that encapsulates the Chromium Edge browser from Microsoft. Now notice that since Microsoft started shipping the final version of the component, there were some incompatibility with the preview version that we were supporting. Now we have support for the final version. The final WebView 2 can be distributed without installing the Edge browser. So you can ask your customers or even distribute along with your application, the WebView 2 component. Again, this does not install Edge as an application on the end user machine, but only the engine 
that allows you to place a TH browser component in your, in your VCL application and drop them directly. We also added a specific feature that was not in the preview version, which is a custom cache folder. Because TH browser caches data and caches data on file, you can now specifically say where those files need to be cached on your uh, end user computers. And with this, let's look at a couple of demos of the new VCL features that Jim is going to show you. Jim? Thanks, Marco. The T number box is the first new VCL control I want to tell you about. It can be found in the Windows 10 group down on the component palette. It gives you the ability to have a number box with these buttons to increment the value. It also has the ability to exp uh, handle expressions. I made this little demo here to show it off because I think it's a lot more interesting to set properties at runtime. You can see that it works great in a number of uh, styles. Here's a few expressions. You can handle multiplication. You can handle division, which that came out zero, but if I switch it over to float, we'll see it's 0 0.3. And it can even handle subtraction and more complicated ones with parentheses in it as well. There's also a mode for currency and you can change the currency symbol to whatever symbol you want, as well as change the layout of the currencies. You can use the up and down arrow keys to change this, including page up and page down. to go by the large step or the small step. So page up, page down is large step, page up page, or up and down arrow keys is small step. So I can change this here to, and now my arrow keys go up by two. You can set the max value and the min value. If you don't, it defaults to unlimited and you can change the font size and it will actually resize the box if you have auto size set to true. The buttons over here are customizable. You can change the colors on them. And a few different layout options. I like this layout option here. If it's a larger one, this is nice, but when you're trying to save space, this one's great. And then you can turn off the divider lines there as well. Very configurable. It's great that you can use expressions in it. Uh, making it like a mini calculator. Oh, and then the mouse wheel. This is, I love this, being able to do it with the mouse wheel. And there is the T number box. And next up is the new T control list. It's available down here in Windows 10, T control list. Uh, it also, there's a T control list button and that's for the button in here. And the reason is, is the T control list lets you put any, any graphic control, T graphic control descendant and regular buttons are T win control descendant. Now these are in the windows 10 category, but they are not windows 10 specific. They just look like they would, the kind of controls are available on windows 10. You can right click on it and select from a number of preset configurations here. This is a great way to get started. I've gone ahead and set some items up on here to show this off though. This is going to do a list with 10 million items on it, which is set right here by item count. And you can see here, this is showing you when the drawing event occurs, right? So as I scroll through, if I go all the way to the last list, so it's drawn zero through four each time here, which is the only ones visible. When I go to last, see it only draws the last few there. And also notice that it has images on here, but it's only drawing the images that it's displaying. Now, each time I scroll through this, you'll notice it is drawing the full list again because it has to undraw the one that was highlighted and draw the highlighted version as well. In here, I'm using a button. I click the button and it sets a button count on it. So very, very fast way. Notice it's a dynamic scroll bar here to have a lot of potential controls. I'm disabling some of them here just so you can see what the disabled looks like as well. Show you a real quick little bit of the code here. It's pretty straightforward. 
you on enable items, this is where I determine which items are enabled. And before draw item is where I'm indicating that I'm drawing the items, adding that to the list box. And on here, this is label one and label two. And there's only one instance of label one and label two. So here I'm setting the label one caption, but I know which item index I'm drawing right here. And then here I'm setting the label two caption based on whether or not I have any clicks for that button or not. If it, I don't have clicks, then I turn the label two invisible. Now it's important to remember that you only have one instance of that label. So if I set it visible here with a caption here, and then the next index, I don't change the value, it'll still be visible with that caption. So anything you change, you need to change it for every one of them. After draw items and after draw item, after draw items is after all the items have been drawn. So the entire draw finishes. Before draw item is before an individual item draws. This is before all items draw. So that's how I indicated how many paints had occurred is with that. And that's really all there is to it. It's pretty straightforward. There's an enable items, enable control, and a show control right here. So this is the one you'd use to change the controls visibility, which I probably should have done the other one there, but you can do it in that spot as well. So you have some flexibility as far as how you use it. The In this one, where the show control enable control, you get a control pass to you. So you can deal with it that way. Uh, or you can do it through the uh, before draw and after draw. Now this is also usable through with live bindings. So here I have live binding set up. Let me show the prototype bind source. And I just have some colors in here. It's also got controls here, so it's configurable, so you can change the layout and change the background color on here. There's not a lot of code in this one. It's pretty straightforward. Right here is where I'm doing the before draw item. I'm getting the color and then changing the color of the background. And then also looking at the state to determine if it's uh, selected or not. And then I just do that via a border. Run this. So again, I can jump straight to the last very quickly. We can also change the item width, height, item margins. So it shows off how configurable it is. And if I jump to the last, you'll see as I remove the total number of items I can have, it's removing them there. And as I select them, you see, uh, so I can jump to a certain item in the list if I wanted to. And uh, yeah, there it is. So this is a, a nice simple one, but just showing that it can be done with live bindings, as well as the fact that you can change, do some custom drawing. And now I'll hand things back to David to talk to you about some new productivity features and user experience enhancements that are pretty exciting. Hi everyone. David here. 1042 has a lot of improvements in the general area of IDE productivity. We'll be looking at some app wizards meant to help create a non trivial app faster, at what we've changed in the IDE, some of the great changes to Code Insight this release, the migration tool which helps you move between computers or upgrade, and a new installation option, the Silent Installer. Over some of the following slides, I will go past some points quickly. And that's because I'd like to show them to you in a live demo rather than via slides. When you create a new app, whether it's VCL or FireMonkey, you have a plain form and no logic. You need to build the app from scratch, and that may be fine for experienced developers, but it's not so great for those new to development. And if you're experienced, you may want a faster way as well. Soon after 10.4.2, we plan to ship some wizards for Delphi that create a new FireMonkey application for you. We'll have a number of standard screens, a home screen, a login screen, settings, and so forth, all of which are functional and integrated together. The idea is that it gives you the framework, a working app for a non-trivial and useful application, which you can then extend yourself. This wizard will be released a few weeks after 10.4.2 and will be in Getit. 10.4.2 brings many improvements to the IDE. The biggest is a great productivity scenario 
In Tinfoil 2, it's possible to have both the form designer and the code for a unit open at the same time. This means you can design your form and edit the code for that form in two windows. I'll show this in the demo soon. In a smaller change, we have a new theme called Mountain Mist due to its grey and blue colours. The theme is reminiscent of older versions of Red Studio and also has been requested by some users for reasons of eyesight and contrast. We hope the new theme will be pleasant for you to use. We've also improved using the IDE over a remote desktop. With many people working from home currently, some IT companies let you run Red Studio on a computer at home, but some require you to remote desktop into a machine in the office. We want to help those working from home, and we've improved IDE behavior and stability here, even reducing the network traffic that it takes. Many dialogues have been improved, and I'll show one example, the compile dialogue, in the live demo. Finally, we have an improvement that is largely under the hood and invisible, but very useful. If you've ever seen issues where the blue dots weren't in the right place when debugging, or the IDE inserted code but put it one character away from where it should have been, the underlying cause of that was most likely an issue in the source code. The file had incorrect line endings, causing the IDE to miscount. This can happen by using other editors, or having incorrect git settings, or a variety of other ways. In 10.4.2, the IDE detects mixed and inconsistent line endings in your source and will fix them for you. This is optional and fully configurable. There are a few other IDE improvements as well. You can now add platforms to a FireMonkey project even if you did not have that platform installed when you upgraded the project. The IDE has a dialog showing you what it's doing when it's doing something lengthy. The File New dialog has a button to access the object repository and templates. An old feature, but one we want to make more accessible. Finally, we have a very neat feature that will help make your project settings set up agnostic. You can convert absolute paths to ones using environment variables, meaning they can more easily be moved between different computers using different setups. Or component vendors can install to any location and just set an environment variable for where those components are. This should really help make a project easy to move to a newer version of the IDE as well. Now, let's talk about Code Insight and LSP. We introduced this technology for Delphi in 10.4.0, and it's one of the things Delphi users are most excited about. We have some good changes in 10.4.2. First, a few changes for both Delphi and C++. In 10.4.2, we've extended Error Insight to show not just code errors, but warnings and hints as well. Both warnings and hints are often important information indicating potential problems and seeing them highlighted in the editor can really improve your code quality. And now you can see them immediately, instead of waiting until you compile. I'll show this and some related features in a live demo in a moment. While we were at it, we changed how the underlines draw. As well as the traditional red squiggly, you can now render a wave, solid underline, or dots. You can see all four in the screenshot on the screen. The idea again is to improve visibility, I personally really like the dots. Finally, when the LSP server is working and calculating data, you can see its status and progress on the projects view. We've been working steadily on Delphi's LSP code insight since we introduced it in 10.4, and we've added some great things this release. One neat feature is that you can control click on the method name and it will jump to the implementation or declaration, just like control shift up or down does. We've also improved completion for generic methods, including code completion inserting the generic types. Plus, a feature that I find really cool, you can now control click on the inherited keyword. We've also done a lot of work under the hood. These changes improve features so that it behaves as you'd expect. They are features that are subtle and you may not notice unless you go back to an older version and miss them, but that are very useful. For example, code completion in the users clause is really useful and now it shows units from the search and projects path. Or we have some internal improvements to overload resolution, which improves things like showing the right overload for parameter completion, or navigating to the right method when you control click on an overloaded method. Code completion will also work much better when you're using packages now. We've tweaked or changed dozens of other areas, far too many to list. You can see a few on screen. The takeaway is just how many things in LSP have been improved and changed, so when you use it in 10.4.2, you 
should provide some great functionality. For Code Insight for C++, we've also done a lot of work focusing on feature quality. There's been a lot of work both on the LSP server and in the IDE. And if you had issues using code completion before, the common causes for that have been resolved. If your C++ unit is well formed, that is if it compiles by itself without having to use pre-compiled headers, code completion is likely to work well. C++ also gains the general IDE improvements to Code Insight that we added this release and discussed earlier, such as the info in the editor status bar, which we'll see in the demo for Delphi in a moment, but applies to C++ too, and the new underline styles for Error Insight. Let's have a quick look at some of this in practice. Here's Red Studio 10.4.2. You can see I'm using the new grey and blue theme, which we call Mountain Mist. As I open this project, you can see a new progress dialog that shows what the IDE is doing. For a small project like this one, it shows only for half a second, but if you have a large project or project group, it will show for longer, and you'll be able to understand what the IDE is processing. You can also see Code Insight is processing the project. And now it's ready. You can also see some messages that I have incorrect line endings in the code. Here, the IDE has noted they are consistently LF, which is not the Windows standard. Now, because they're consistent, even if wrong, the IDE isn't changing them. But it points out to me that I've not configured Git correctly. On Windows, Git should change line endings to be CRLF. Here are the GitHub docs, which you can find easily by googling Git line endings, and this shows you how to configure Git correctly for Windows. If the line endings were mixed, that is, an inconsistent mix of LF and CRLF, the IDE would fix them for me, which is optional. You can turn that off. In this project, I have a form, and of course can toggle between the form designer and the code editor. But what if I want to both design the form and edit the code for the form at the same time? In 10.4.2, I can do that in two windows, here creating a new edit window, I'm recording a single screen, but one really useful case is if you work with multiple monitors and want to have either the code or designer on a second monitor. Both are open and usable at the same time. Let's try compiling. You can see that the dialog now shows the compile status clearly. Here, a green check mark and success in larger text. If the compile failed, that would be similarly clear. The idea is that you can see the status of your build just by quickly scanning. Now let's have a look at Code Insight. The first thing to notice is that we have hints and warnings visible in the code editor the same way errors were. Here I have both a hint in blue and a warning in orange. You can change how hints and warnings look, and for this demo I've chosen not to use the traditional red squiggly underline, but the new dots. We have several new ways to render errors, warnings, and hints, and they are all meant to be more visible and easier to see. You can also see there's an icon in the editor gutter, and a summary of the hints and warnings in the editor status bar. While I'm here, I'm going to complete this method. It's a generic method. I'm using Spring4D. And you can see the method is completed with the angle brackets, so I can type in the right type. Back in the main form, there are a few things to demo. First, I'm going to complete in the users clause, which has many improvements this release in the units it shows. One particularly neat thing is that you can see here that it knows the unit I'm adding has already been added. Then you can see the form constructor here calls the inherited constructor. New in 10.4.2 is that you can control click on inherited. See how as I hold control, it turns into a blue link, or right-click and find definition. This works for all inherited methods. Finally, we've had many, many tweaks and changes to LSP, improving a wide range of things. Here's just one, where I'm going to demonstrate co-completion working in an active ifdef block. You can see I have a method that only exists if I'm compiling for Windows. And note the helpful hint that's new in the editor, pointing out that it's declared but not used. You might never spot that if it hadn't been indicated visually. When I scroll to the method and note it's inside this ifdef, I can complete inside it. 
and also complete to show it in another method. We have many other changes and tweaks to LSP that are similar, making the entire feature work better across all types of source and coding patterns. The Migration Tool is a utility that helps you move settings when you upgrade Rad Studio or install on a new computer. We've made some key changes this release with some presets to help you use it for three scenarios. When you're updating a minor version, such as moving from 10.4.1 to 10.4.2, usually the installer handles this for you, but you can manage moving settings yourself. When you're upgrading across a major version, such as moving from 10.3 or 10.2 or even XE4 up to 10.4, or when you're moving from one computer to another. In addition, instead of just moving registry settings, the migration tool now migrates other files as well. Find out configuration files, your IDE's desktop layouts, platform configuration, and code formatting configuration. All up these changes are meant to make it much easier for you to preserve settings and to move or update your Delphi or C++ Builder configuration. Finally, a really useful change to the installer. Before 10.4.2, the installer always ran with a visual UI and you had to click through it to make choices and install. Now we've introduced silent installation, making it much easier to install by configuring up front and letting the installer do its work. This is especially useful for sysadmins of large companies when you want to install Delphi or C++ Builder on multiple computers. We have two levels here. The silent installer, which still shows a UI, or the very silent installer, which is fully command line only. With that, I'll hand over to Marco to discuss FireMonkey. Thanks, David. In 10.4.2, we have expanded the FireMonkey platforms that Rust Studio supports. Specifically, since the release of 10.4.1, there have been new operating systems available from Apple and Google. And what we did was provide some support for these platforms via patches for 10.4.1 that were released over the last few months. Now with 10.4.2, we are officially supporting development and debugging on these three versions of the mobile and X operating systems. If we want to get to the specifics, for Android 11, we fully support debugging on a device. We have improved the support for a bundle that is a Delphi only feature because it requires 32 bit and 64 bit deployment in a single bundle. We have significantly enhanced and redesigned the sensors management layer for Android. In the previous version, we were only supporting the primary sensor for each type. Now you can have as many sensors of a type that the device actually provides. We've also improved the performance of the camera component on the Android platform. Getting to macOS, which is a Delphi only support, we have support for macOS 11 Big Sur with Intel based application, meaning if you have an Intel device, you can build, deploy and debug on the device. If you have an ARM-based Mac, application can be executed via the Rosetta 2 layer, but the support for development and debugging is not complete for ARM-based Mac. Now, as you might have seen, we have in our Rust Studio roadmap the plan to natively support ARM-based Macs uh, with, with a new target in the near future. The other thing that we added might look minor, but it's actually quite handsy, is the new 124 by 124 image format to the default icons files. And finally, for iOS 14, again, we support deploying and debugging on the device, but we've also added a significant new feature, which is support for two Firebase, Google Firebase features on the iOS platform, namely uh, advertising with a new T Firebase banner ad component and uh, cloud messaging Firebase cloud messaging or push notifications via the Google infrastructure for iOS. Now, this leads to another new area, which is Delphi language and C++ language and compilers specific features. I'll start with the Delphi side, highlighting the fact that we have significant compiler improvements, and then I'll let David continue on the C++ side of the tool chain. Talking about Delphi, as I mentioned, we have focused on compiler performance. We have implemented over 30 new fixed bug patches into the core compiler, 
And some of our customers in the beta have reported up to 90% reduction of the compilation time compared to 10 for one. Now, this is not a universal faster compiler for some customers in some code bases, the compiler was already significantly fast. There are still a few cases where the compiler could perform better and that's something we'll continue to focus on in uh, new and coming uh, releases. We have also enhanced the quality of the compiler. We introduced many fixes that improve the backwards compatibility with existing code and really improve the overall performance of the Delphi compiler. And with that, I'll let David continue on the C++ side of the tool chain. Thanks, Marco. We have some great changes to C++ in 1042 with some changes and features focused on quality. The first is around the linker, where we have a feature focused on reducing the memory strain on the Win64 linker. We solve this in a deceptively simple way, simply by giving the linker much less data to link. Normally when linking, the compiled code and the debug information are included together in the object file and processed together by the linker. Now we have an option to split the debug information out to a separate file. This means the object files that the linker links contain only the compiled code, meaning the linker has much less to process. We hope this will help those with large projects or projects that stress the linker. If you've had trouble there, 1042 is well worth testing out. We've also revised the exception handling in the compiler in RTL. We focused on C++ exceptions, SEH, and OS exceptions in a single module, but also cross-module scenarios, where an exception is thrown in DLL and caught in Nexi, for example. For applications where all modules are either fully statically linked or fully dynamically linked. This is the kind of under-the-hood work that isn't a visible new feature in the IDE, but should make your applications much more robust and we recommend upgrading for the reliability improvements this will give your software. We also have an updated version of the Dinkumware STL with many tweaks and fixes. We plan to have several more popular open source libraries available on Get It Soon after release as well. Let's have a look at some of the general quality enhancements we've made in 1042. The Parallel Programming Library, or PPL, is a key library we provide to help you take advantage of multi-core computers and keep your app responsive by doing work in the background. We've been improving it steadily through the 10.4 releases, and that has continued in 10.4.2, with a lot of quality improvements, including worker thread termination, improvements to futures, and changes to the thread pool count. There's also been a lot of work on WSDL imports and SOAP, with several dozen fixes. On the debugger side, we've made improvements to the Platform Assistant server for Windows, including where it writes output, and also enabled some environment variables in the Attached to Process dialog. There are two new debug visualizers as well, one for generic lists, queues, and stacks, which lets you see their contents much more easily, and one for streams, like tMemoryStream, allowing you to view the stream contents as text or even as a hex view. Both these should be highly useful. I'll now hand back over to Marco to discuss more quality improvements we've made. Thanks, David. Continuing with the quality enhancements that were done in Time for Two for the virtual libraries, there are a few things that are worth highlighting for VCL and FMX. For FMX, we have worked quite a bit on native style controls improvements in terms of Z order. We have improved the meta driver for iOS and the macOS worked on better support for multiple monitors on the Windows platforms and focused on TMEMO component for various platforms, but specifically for macOS. Talking about VCL, we focused a lot on VCL styles and high DPI related issues with uh, numerous fixes. We have improved the DP control grid to work beyond 100 rows. We don't exactly know what this limitation was in the product has been for many years and fixed a fairly bad regression with the font of T-Speed but component that was introduced in Tempo 1. Now these are only a few of the many changes and improvements that were done in these areas because we really focused a lot on quality in this release. For FIDA we improved case sensitive columns with interbase, improved SQLite, creation of tables with, for Oracle, 
uh, MongoDB connection, uh, FD event alerter with Postgres, and MySQL native time. Uh, as you can see, it's a number of small but relevant fixes throughout various drivers and database engines, but also we did a lot of general FIDAC fixes on core classes like the TFD dataset, which is the main class for datasets in FireDuck. We made several changes around HTTP REST client libraries and the cloud support. The most relevant is that we've unified the use of timeouts for synchronous operations. They were a bit inconsistent, specifically in the way zero and minus one were used to indicate no timeout or infinite timeout. Now these have been aligned, so they behave the same throughout the two libraries. We have enhanced the multi-part form data management for REST requests. We have improved the integration with AWS by allowing a custom content type and also made some changes to the Azure Blob service. These are only a few of the relevant issues that we fixed, but overall, Time for 2 addresses over 600 customer reported issues on Quality Portal, plus hundreds of issues reported during the Time for 2 beta by beta testers and a large number of internally found issues. So overall, it's over a thousand different issues that have been addressed in Time for 2. We have also included support for a couple of dozen features that have been requested as features, not as, not as bug reports, in the quality portal. Now we can summarize Time for Two by having a quick look to the SKUs, the different options this is delivered. We have a professional, an enterprise, and an architect version, like it happened in recent releases. The professional version includes Windows, Mac, mobile tool change, the core FireDuck, and both VCL and FireMonkey. The, the enterprise adds the Delphi Linux target, adds RAT server and DataSnap multi-tier architecture and additional FireDuck drivers for more databases. The Architect Editions bundles additional tools, including XJS for creating JavaScript-based applications for the browser, Aquadata Studio for managing your database data, and RunRx for testing your VCL user interfaces. On top of this, there are additional RAD server deployment licenses. There are also exclusive plugins that are available for Temp42 for, for update subscription customers with an active subscription, including Twine Compile for faster C++ compilation, the Konopka signature controls, a number of ID enhancements, including bookmarks, navigator, Parnassus, Parallel Debugger, and large number of premium styles for both VCL and FireMonkey. We can open up for questions. You can ask now on the live webinar or reach any of us at the emails listed below.